So um, we're doing a sermon series titled Christmas Gifts, and this week we're going to talk about the Christmas gift of joy. And I'm going to start off by sharing with you uh, perhaps the most magnificent statement uh, ever spoken about joy. And there's a few things you need to know before I share part of the statement with you. The first thing is, is that the, uh, the author of this statement, the person who spoke it, um, is a teenage girl, and um, she's engaged to be married. And it's an arranged marriage, we think. Second, she's pregnant, and she didn't choose to get pregnant, so in some cases it could say that she's pregnant against her will. And third, the man that she's engaged to marry, this guy Joseph, he is not the father. And so you can imagine that her situation is one that is quite terrifying. Her situation is one where there'd be quite a lot of fear, there would be some anger, there would be some distrust, there'd be some confusion. Hers is not a situation that at least I would imagine that would be a happy one or one that would provoke joy. And so for that reason and others, I think that this statement that we're going to look at is quite remarkable when it comes to joy. It goes like this. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Now, this Mary, the mother of Jesus, but she steps on the scene as Mary, as a, a, a young girl who is in an arranged marriage with a, a man named Joseph, who's probably quite a bit older than her. And before the marriage takes place, she's told that she's going to be pregnant by an angel. And she's got a lot of questions around that. And when Joseph finds out, he tells her that he intends to break off the marriage. And so that means for Mary that she is now going to have an unstable future to say the least, especially in that culture. And her parents are probably looking at her funny, and her neighbors are probably looking at her funny, and her math teacher is probably looking at her funny. You know, whoever it is that's in her life is probably wondering and saying that, you know, it was an angel that got me pregnant just probably doesn't land well with most people. And yet, despite these circumstances, Despite this really difficult situation, she's able to make this statement about joy. She's able to say that the Mighty One has done great things. So what we want to do is, is take a look at this statement and, and think about how is it that somebody in this circumstance, somebody in this situation, can have this kind of joy? Because you just might be experiencing a situation that you wouldn't ask for, a situation that you wouldn't wish on anybody. You might be in a situation or you might have had a circumstance in your life or maybe it's somebody that you're close to that has that circumstance where it'd be really hard to claim joy. So let's see what we can learn from Mary and what she has to say. Now, I think the first thing that would be helpful to do is to make a distinction between happiness and joy for the purpose of today. Sometimes you hear about those two things being kind of used interchangeably, but today we're going to make a distinction. And happiness is about what is happening. For the purpose of today, let's understand happiness is simply about what is happening, meaning that it's, it's in the present, it's in the right now, and if your situation is good, you're probably happy, and if your situation becomes not so good, it probably harms your happiness. Happiness, you know, you can see it on somebody's face oftentimes. If somebody's happy, they do what? They smile, they laugh, they high-five, they, they greet well, and then when somebody's not happy, you can see it on their face as well. Oftentimes they don't even greet you at all and they're downcast. So happiness, it's, it's about what's happening now. It's situational, it's contextual, it's circumstantial. And if your situation changes, so changes your happiness. Now joy, joy is about what has happened and about what will happen. Happiness is about the present, but joy is about the past and the future. So let's look at these one at a time. Joy is about what has happened. When we're thinking about our past, a, a principle that I think is really helpful is this. What you focus on determines how you feel. And I think that applies in a lot of different circumstances, but in terms of your past, what you focus on determines how you feel. And you can look at the same 
events, the same circumstances, but depending on what you focus on will determine how you feel about it. A couple weeks ago, I was hanging out with some of my new neighbors. Uh, Hannah and I have really lucked out. We moved into a neighborhood that already had some good neighbors and more people have moved in with young families. And so we're getting to know some of them. And so we're talking and we're doing that thing that you do when you're getting to know other couples. You ask, how'd you guys meet? And so one by one, the couples are talking about how they met. And we, and we get to this, this one guy and his wife is in the other room and she's having a different conversation. But she must have overheard our conversation because when it's his time to tell the story about how they met, she comes into the room. And he looks up and he says, well, do you want to tell the story? And she says, no, I just wanted to hear how you're going to tell the story. We all know, right? We all kind of focus on different details and how you tell the story, what you focus on will determine how you feel. You can look at your history and you can look at all the times you've been wronged, all the times you missed the mark, all the times somebody has insulted you or disrespected you. And you can do that and that's all true, but it will lead to a certain kind of feeling. Or you can look at your past and you can highlight, you can, you can focus on the times where God has come through or somebody's come through. You can highlight the times when somebody's been kind to you or the things that you have been given, and that will change how you feel. Look what Mary does. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord. What's Mary focusing on? Talk to me now, come on. What's she focusing on? My soul magnifies the Lord. I'm going to look at my history, and the thing that I'm going to put the magnifying glass on is the actions and the words of the Lord. Look what happens. And my spirit rejoices. It has joy. I magnify the Lord, and my spirit has joy in God, my Savior, who has done great things for me. What do you mean he's done great things for you? He got you pregnant, and now your, your husband-to-be wants to break it off, and everybody's asking you questions. Great things for you? Yeah because I'm going to magnify what the Lord has said to me, not what others are saying about me, but the promises that God has said to me. And it changes how she feels about herself in the present. Now, for those of you who would like to magnify the Lord in your past, but you're like, so how do I do that? Because you're wondering, you know, how do I know if, if I focus on that detail or that story that that was actually God, right? I mean, I'm with you if you're kind of skeptical about that, if you're wondering about that, because that's, that's a big question. Well, the key is, and this is such a preacher answer, such a churchy answer, I, I get that, but just stick with me. But the key is, is to look through the lens of Jesus. Jesus is the magnifying glass through which we see the activity of the Lord in our life. Look at what he says. He says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. That one of the central claims of Christianity is simply this, that God is in some ways unknowable, but through the person of Jesus Christ, we have a reliable image of what God is like. And so if you begin to know the person of Jesus Christ, you'll begin to recognize the activity of God in your life. So the question simply is for you and me, how well do you know him? Can you quote him? Can you tell any of his stories? When a situation arises, can you say, you know, I know what Jesus would say? Because that's what it means to know him. And when you know him that well, it's easy to see the activity of the Lord in your life. And how you look at your past, what you focus on, what you magnify, will determine how you feel. Joy is also about the future, about what will happen. And a principle for that is, is what you hope for determines how you feel. So what we hope for will determine how we feel. Look what Mary says. Surely from now on, generations will call me blessed. In all the situation, all the things that she could hope for, she is holding on to this hope that, hey, in the future, I'm going to be called blessed. And you know what? Every generation since Mary said that, at least some of the people have called her blessed. And this ended up being true. But Mary, she's, she's hoping for this positive future, even though in the moment, her situation is really, really difficult. Let's be honest. Those of you that are analytical, which I'm kind of one of those people, um, maybe this will be helpful. Um, so uh, 
turn on your, your thinking caps for a moment. Okay, so imagine your life. Your life has past, present, and future. Everybody's still with me? Okay, that was kind of a joke. No, nobody? All right, okay. Past, present, and future. And then um, the light gray is, imagine that that's your external world. That's everything outside of you. That's your relationships, that's your job, that's uh, the weather, everything in the external world. So you got that going on. And then you have your internal world, your motivations, your feelings, your intentions, how you make meaning. And so this is you, okay? And so happiness, I've been saying, is a matter of the present, and it's really a factor of the external world. It's situational, it's contextual. If you have a good circumstance, you'll probably be pretty happy. And if uh, your circumstances aren't good, you probably won't be very happy. But joy, joy, it's, it's really a matter of interpretation. So in terms of your past, if you look at your past and you magnify uh, the activity of God in your life, you're going to feel this thing called joy. And here's the cool thing, is that that joy will influence how you feel in the present. And you begin to feel better about your present circumstances. They haven't changed, but now you got this joy reflecting on your history and God's activity in your history, and now your present feels a little bit different. But it gets even better. If you also lean into the promises that God has for your future, if you just make a decision and say, hey, you know what, uh, of all the possibilities for my future, I'm just going to go ahead and begin to believe what God has promised, like Mary did. You'll begin to have joy in regards to your future, and again, that joy is going to influence how you feel in the present. Now, you can feel happy, but have really no joy, but that happiness will be fleeting, it will change when your circumstances change. But if you cultivate joy by, by reflecting on your past and choosing to magnify God's activity in your past, and if you cultivate joy by looking into your future and saying, I'm just going to go ahead and claim these promises, that's going to change how you feel in the present. And it's going to give you a source of really happiness that is beyond your circumstances. So back to this guy. Um, if you haven't been here for any of this, let me explain. Uh, the statue is uh, Simon Peter, or at least it's supposed to be. I think that's probably in Rome somewhere. And, and Simon is the man's name. Peter's a nickname. Peter means rock or rocky, which is why we have Sly Stallone up there who played Rocky. Who's seen the movie Rocky or are familiar with it? Most of us have, right? Um, and for the past few weeks, I've been talking about these parallels between these two men. Simon and Rocky, they both had dreams and they kind of missed their opportunity. And it seemed like their situation was hopeless. And then somebody came from the outside and Rocky's situation was Apollo Creed decides he's gonna give some no-name boxer a chance for the title. In Peter's uh, situation, it was Jesus who showed up and said, hey, I'm gonna call you to be a fisherman of men. And Peter's life changed. Another parallel is uh, both of them took a lot of punches. If you've seen the movie Rocky, you would understand his fighting style was not realistic because he just takes shots off the face over and over again, but somehow he ends up triumphing. And Peter, he took a lot of punches. He took some literal punches. He was beaten up on one occasion. He was also in prison three times, had several of his friends killed. And both of these men, despite their circumstances, despite the situation they were in, they were able to move forward with love, with peace, with joy, in a way that was just beyond what seemed reasonable. So I want to take you back uh, to a statement that, that Peter makes, uh, a man who, who saw Jesus uh, arrested and crucified, who saw some of his, of his friends murdered, a guy who had been through quite a lot. And I want to take you back to um, a statement that he makes that we talked about a couple of weeks ago and then continue on a little bit further. So here's what Peter says. He says, you've been born anew into a living hope. Hope is about the future. And we have this hope, and we're going to talk about what that hope is in just a second. And you've been born anew into a living hope. This future, this promise is changing the way you're living right now. Well, how do we get that? Well, Peter says, I'll tell you. You got it through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, this event happened. In history, Peter would say. In his lifetime, he would tell us. And 
we were transformed by it. Because we were following along, we thought we knew what was up, and our situation was pretty good. We had this guy, Jesus, and he like could walk on water, and he was healing everybody, and we were like rock stars everywhere we went. And when we ran out of food, somehow we just magically made more food. Like our situation was good. It was easy to be happy. And then he gets arrested, and he gets beaten and crucified, and then he's dead, like for three days. Long enough for us to figure it's all over. No more joy, no more hope, no more future. And then something happened in history that changed the world. And Peter says what happened is that God demonstrated his power over death. And this man Jesus was resurrected. And because that happened, and because we're focused and we're magnifying that, we have this hope that changes the way we feel right here and now. And here's the hope. You have a pure and enduring inheritance that cannot perish. An inheritance that is presently kept safe for you in heaven. Translation, there's a room for you in heaven. It's already been prepared for you. It's not based on what you've done or haven't done. You can't earn it. It's there because of who Jesus was and who God is. And this is this hope. And when it comes to your future, there's all sorts of things you can believe. And some of those things are more realistic than others, but none of them are airtight because you can't predict the future. You can't. And so you have to ask yourself, in terms of what I, what I believe about the future, how is it affecting me here in the present? Because you can believe your future is hopeless or it's meaningless or, or whatever. There's a ton of options, and that will affect how you feel in the present. Or you can believe this promise. And you can tap into this energy, tap into this perspective, tap into this resiliency that people like Peter, like Paul, like Matthew, and like many other followers of Jesus who we've never heard of, tapped into. And because of them, generation after generation, our world is different. We're here today. So it's your choice. For those of you that might lean into this, or those of you who already have made this decision to say, you know what, I've looked at the options out there, and I've weighed you know, the, the pluses and minuses. I'm just saying, uh, this promise of God, like it just seems kind of better than anything else. This idea of grace, that really changes things if we were actually embrace it. And so I'm, I'm going to go with that. Like, it's not airtight, but I'm going to go with that. For those of you that have decided that or lean in that direction, hear what else Peter has to say. You now rejoice in this hope. You now have joy in this hope. What hope? This, this hope about your future that is based on something that happened in the past. You now rejoice in this hope, even if it's necessary for you to be distressed for a short time, by various trials. Christianity has been criticized in the past of being like an opiate for the masses or just this fluffy religion and it's really not based in reality. They've never really read this scripture, is my opinion. Because over and over again, Jesus talks about, Peter talks about, all of them talk about, hey, look, life, we're not saying life is going to be easy if you choose this. Life will be difficult. In fact, at times you'll probably suffer more because you'll make decisions to help people and love people that will cause you to suffer. But you rejoice, you have joy in this hope, even if you have to suffer. And he goes on. Although, and this is great news for all of us, although you've never seen him, you love him. Some of you, you really love him, don't you? You've never seen him. But there's something about your heart that just extends out in his direction. And even though you don't see him now, he's not here. Some of you, because of the way you love others, you provide an image or a glimpse of him. I, I do believe that, but he's not here. Even though you, you don't see him now, you do trust him. You're, you're handing your life over. You're believing that, you know what, actually, the thing that's going to give me the most joy in life, the thing that's going to make me the most satisfied in my life is to not hoard all the things that have been given to me, but actually give my life away. Some of us, some of you, believe that, and you're trusting him 
that that's the best way to live. And so you rejoice with a glorious joy that is too much for words. Sometimes we can't explain it. It just feels right. It feels more significant. And sometimes it's not the happiest thing, but it feels like the most significant, the most powerful, the most meaningful thing. And he finishes off this way. If you're doing all this, guess what? You're receiving the goal of your faith, your ability to do what you can do and trust God with what only God can do. You're receiving the goal of your faith, your salvation. Now, let me be clear here. Your eternal salvation, the, the way I understand the gospel, that's been taken care of because of who Jesus is and because of the grace of God. But sometimes you can have that eternal salvation in the future, but you're living today like you're lost. You're living today like it's all gone. And Peter's saying, if, if you lean into this, if you begin to understand this, if you begin to think of your future in terms of God's promise and you magnify God's present in your past, it will change the way you live now and you will receive your salvation even in this moment. Less anxiety, less worry, less anger, more forgiveness, more courage, more extension of yourselves to love others, more fruit of the Spirit, your salvation. Kind of tie all this together for you with two simple statements. Hopefully you find this helpful. Your happiness, as we talked about it today, is, is determined by your situation. And that's not a bad thing or a good thing. It's just a thing, right? Your situation is good. You probably feel pretty good. Your situation is not good. Um, all things being even, you probably won't feel very good. Your happiness is in many regards determined by your situation. Your joy, on the other hand, is determined by your salvation. Meaning this idea that, that God has done something for you you couldn't possibly do for yourself. You've been given a gift, a Christmas gift that you didn't earn, that you didn't purchase, that you couldn't earn or purchase. And because you've been given this thing that is so great, that is the reason that you give yourself away. It's not out of guilt or obligation. It's better than that. It's out of joy. So if this has resonated with you, today. There's something in my message, something in hopefully uh, I was able to get out of the way enough that God's word was able to come through to you. Um, I invite you to join me in this statement. You said it already. Um, I'll lead you, so I'll say it first, and then if you'll just follow me. Um, and if your heart wants to get a hold of some of this joy that, that Peter had, that Mary had, that I think that God wants for you, um, join it. My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices. The mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. If you'll allow me, I'd like to pray for you. God, I, I lift up each individual here. And I ask that they might begin to see you in their lives that your activity, that your promises, that your faithfulness would be magnified so that they would have assurance, so that they would feel gratitude, so that they would have joy. For God, I think that you want us all to be joy-filled people. As joy-filled people, we make a difference. We give, we love, we forgive. And so God, I pray that joy might be found in the hearts everyone here. In the name of Jesus Christ.